we've talked about bonding in the past. You've probably heard about it in all sorts of earlier physical science type courses. Today, I want to go into a little more detail about ionic, covalent, and metallic bonding and what those really look like on an atomic level. Ionic bonds involve the transfer of electrons. Um, you might say that ionic bonds involve stolen electrons. In the example shown here, we have sodium and chlorine. Sodium starts off with 11 total electrons. Chlorine is going to start off with 17. Chlorine really wants to have 18 in total. That would make it the same electronic structure as argon, which is one of our noble gases. Sodium, on the other hand, wants to lose its 11th electron so that it has a total of 10. That is the same electron configuration as neon. So the sodium is going to completely let go of one of its electrons. That electron is going to be attracted to the chlorine atom. We're going to end up with a sodium cation and a chlorine chloride anion. In an ionic compound, the positive charge on the cation and the negative charge on the anion are going to attract each other. And that's what actually holds the, the compound together. Most ionic structures are going to form some sort of crystalline lattice. We'll talk about this in a lot more detail later on. But for now, know that ionic compounds don't exist as individual pairs of ions, for example. Sodium and chlorine form this repeating pattern where each chloride anion is attracted to all of the sodium cations that surround it. We say that ionic bonds are non-directional. And what we mean by that is it's not between two specific atoms or ions. The ionic bonds form between lots of atoms all at one time. When we talk about the strength of an ionic bond, we're really talking about the lattice energy. And the lattice energy is the amount of energy, usually in kilojoules per mole, that are released when different ions form that lattice, when they settle into that repeating pattern. It's a very stable pattern, and so you're going to get a lot of energy out when it forms. The higher the lattice energy, again, in usually kilojoules per mole, the stronger the bonds are. If we just look at the table on the left, we have cations that all have a plus one charge, lithium, sodium, potassium, all of those alkali metals. And we're looking at our halogens as our anions. We can see that the smaller the ions are, so lithium and fluorine are both very small ions. Potassium is the largest of the cations and iodine is actually fairly huge as atoms go. The smaller the ions, the higher the lattice energy. Basically that means the closer the nuclei can get to each other, the more stable they are once they've settled into that lattice. The table on the right shows a little different information. Now we've got ions that are roughly the same size. So a sodium cation, a magnesium cation, and an aluminum cation are all pretty much the same size. They all have 10 electrons. A fluoride ion and an oxide ion, again, pretty much the same size. Now the thing that is changing is the charge. I do want to point out that the lattice energy that's shown here is per bond. So a magnesium fluoride compound, for example, 
which has two fluoride ions for every one magnesium, is going to have two bonds with that same strength. You can see that as the charge increases, the bond strength increases. And that makes sense because you've got more electrons being transferred. All of the atoms sort of have a higher buy-in. There's more on the line. And so a magnesium that has given two electrons away to oxygen is going to hold on to that oxygen more tightly because of the, the minus two charge. Usually considered to be the opposite of ionic bonding is covalent bonding. And in these types of bonds, you've got nonmetals that are sharing electrons. So nobody is completely losing an electron, nobody is gaining an electron, but the electrons involved in the bond spend some of their time on one nucleus and some of their time on the other nucleus. This figure that I've got here illustrates that you can have single, double, or triple covalent bonds. Each bond involves just two electrons being shared between two nuclei. A double bond means that we have four electrons shared between two atoms, and a triple bond is six electrons shared, again, between just two atoms. Covalent bonds don't form the lattice structures that we see in the ionic bonds. And so in order to talk about the strength of covalent bonds, we talk about the bond energy, and that's related to the bond length. It's not an exact correlation, um, but they do tend to track together. The energy of the bonds is again given in kilojoules per mole, and that's the amount of energy that has to be put into a mole of those bonds in order to break them. So our lattice energy for ionic compounds, remember, is going to be exothermic. We're going to get that energy out. Bond energies for covalently bound atoms is going to be the opposite. We have to put that energy in to break the bonds. It's actually the same sort of idea. You're putting energy in to break bonds and you're getting energy out when they form. We just talk about them in slightly different ways. Now, the table on the left here has carbon with a single bond to hydrogen, fluorine, chlorine, and bromine. Those hydrogen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine atoms are getting larger as we move down our chart. The carbon is obviously the same. The energy of the bonds, a carbon-hydrogen bond is going to be weaker than carbon fluorine, but stronger than the other two. Now, among just the halogens, the smaller the molecule, the stronger the bond, which is what we see with the ionic compounds. The bond length is more connected to the size of the atoms involved, which is why it goes up neatly from hydrogen to fluorine to chlorine to bromine. The bond energy doesn't exactly track that way, right? Because the carbon fluorine bond is longer than carbon hydrogen, but it's also stronger. There are other factors at work in this, and we are going to talk about some of them later on when we get to electronegativity. But for now, just know that energy and length don't always go together. Covalent bonds, like we just said, don't always have to be single bonds. We can have double bonds and triple bonds. And in those cases where you've got the same atoms on either end, but you're looking at a single, a double, and a triple bond, the energy is going to increase significantly as you add these bonds, and the length is going to decrease. It is so consistent among almost all of the carbon-carbon bonds that exist, that if you can tell the length of a carbon-carbon bond, 
you can determine what we call the bond order, which is just a fancy word that means is it single, double, or triple. So if a carbon-carbon bond is 120 picometers long, then you know it's a triple bond. There are some cases, and we'll talk about this when we get to resonance, where you'll see bonds that are in between. Like you might have a compound where all of the carbon-carbon bonds are 144 picometers long. In that case, we know we have resonance. That just means that our bonds aren't really single bonds. They're not really double bonds. They're sort of a bond and a half. Again, we'll come to that later. The last type of bonding that I wanna talk about is metallic bonding. Ionic bonds generally form between a metal and a non-metal. They can happen with just non-metals as long as there are ions involved. Covalent bonds really only happen when we have non-metals. That sort of raises the question of what happens when we just have metal atoms. And the answer to that is we get what we call a sea of electrons. Metal atoms give up extra electrons very easily, even if there's not really a non-metal to give them to. And in those cases, the electrons that have been released by the nuclei form sort of a C. They're able to move around. The metallic cations that are left stay fairly in one place. Um, sort of like the lattice that we see with ionic compounds, but they're surrounded by these movable electrons. Those electrons being delocalized is the, that's the reason for many of the properties of things that we think of as being metallic. Um, metals are good conductors of heat and electricity because those electrons can move around when you take the temperature of something, you're really just measuring how fast its atoms and molecules and particles are moving. So since those electrons can move and bump into each other, they can transfer heat throughout the, the whole sample. It's the same with electricity. Electricity is literally just electrons moving. And so if you push the electrons at one end of a wire, they're going to bump into the electrons all the way down. Metals can also be hammered out into flat sheets. We call that being malleable. And they are ductile, which means you can draw them out into thin wires. All of those properties are also thanks to this loose electron C. If you have an ionic compound, and you hit it with a hammer, the bonds are very rigid. They're very much held in place. And when you shift those bonds, the whole thing cracks, essentially. But a metal, because of these loose flowing electrons, is able to deform in a much more um, productive way. 